Good evening, Erev Tov. My name is Ruth Kaplan, and I serve as the Director of Community Relations at the Israeli Consulate. It's a sacred privilege for me to be hosting this Holocaust Remembrance event this evening on behalf of the Israeli House and on the Consulate. We just listened to the haunting Hebrew song, Halicha Lekesaria, or Walk to Caesarea, which many know simply as Eli Eli. It was beautifully performed by our local Israeli choir group, Pa'amonim, under the direction of Gitit Shoval. Oh God, my God, may it never end. The sand and the sea, the rustle of the water, the brilliance of the sky, the prayer of man. The prayerful words of this song were composed in 1942 by the heroic young Jewish resistance fighter, Hannah Senesch, who in her early 20s was recruited by the British Army on a dangerous mission to parachute into Hungary in order to rescue fellow Hungarian Jews about to be transported to Auschwitz. She was executed by the Nazis when she refused to provide them with information. I can't think of a more fitting way to open our memorial event this evening. The call Holocaust, after all, involves so many acts of resistance and heroism. In fact, Israelis refer to this day as Yom HaShoah Vegevura, the day of remembrance of the Holocaust and of bravery. Tonight, we will be privileged to hear from Michael Grunbaum, who as a young teenager survived the Holocaust along with his mother and sister. The, the courage and resilience, particularly of his mother, will become apparent later in our program. In Israel, on Yom HaShoah, a siren is sounded, at which time the entire country stops to remember the six million who perished. Traffic on major highways comes to a complete halt as people get out of their cars to pay their respects. We are now going to listen to that siren. Consul General, as he recites the memorial prayer, Yis Kor, and lights a memorial candle in memory of the six million Jewish lives extinguished by the Nazis. חללי השואה והגבורה, נשמות 600 רבבות אלפי ישראל שהומתו ושנהרגו ושנחנקו ושנקברו חיים ואת קהילות הקודש שנחרבו על קדושת השם. יזכור אלוהים את אגדתם ואת אגדת שאר קדושי ישראל וגיבוריו מימי עולם ויצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם. הנאהבים והנעימים בחייהם ובמותם לא נפרדו, ינוחו בשלום על משכבותיהם, ונאמר אמן. אמן. 
We will now listen to the beautiful melody chanted by Dr. Yanai Gonsharvsky, as he chants El Malay Rachamim, the prayer for the souls of the dead. <clears throat> We are so fortunate to have as our guest 
this evening, Brookline resident and my neighbor, Michael Grunbaum, who was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia in 1930. After the Nazis occupied the country in 1939, Michael's father was arrested, tortured, and sent to the small fortress in Terezin, where he was killed within two weeks. Michael, his mother and sister, were sent to the Terezin ghetto in 1942 and remained there for two and a half years. Michael was there between the ages of 12 and 14. After the war, the family returned to Prague and left in 1948, spending two years in Cuba before gaining entry into the United States. Michael, who spoke neither English nor Spanish, attended an American high school in Cuba, graduating in two years in time to enter MIT. He has had an amazing professional career, which includes earning a master's degree at Yale in city planning, and then working for the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He later served as a special assistant to the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Works and eventually became a partner in a private engineering company, which he helped to form. He and his late wife, Thelma, were married for 50 years and they have three sons, David, Peter, and Leon. Recently, Michael established a fund at the MIT Music Library in memory of his dear parents. So why at age 85, six years ago, did Michael decide to write his memoir of his teenage experiences at Theresen? We will soon find out why. I had the pleasure of reading this compelling memoir myself this past weekend, and I could not put it down. We're incredibly fortunate to have Michael with us this evening to share a synopsis of his story tonight. And my advice to you all is to read the book. Michael, welcome and please begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to do a reading from my book, Somewhere There's Still a Sun. This book published by Simon & Schuster is my autobiography about the life of a Jewish teenager in Czechoslovakia living under the Nazi regime during World War II and surviving it. The book has already sold some 80,000 copies in the USA and is now available in 14 languages with more to come as soon as we are able to enter the new normal phase of our lives. The first part of the book describes my family's life after the arrival of the Nazis in Prague, when the Germans almost every day issued one degree after another. First, we had to move from our large apartment in a section of Prague where we lived in great comfort. My father was a prominent attorney, one of three of the most important lawyers working for the richest family in Czechoslovakia. My mother was a socialite and supervised our cook and governess. We owned a car, one of the few people who did. We had to give all that up and move to a much smaller apartment in the Prague ghetto. I made a sample list of the almost daily German decrees in no particular order. We had to turn in our car, jewelry, oriental rugs, valuable books, artworks, radios, skis, bicycles, musical instruments, and so on. Anything of any value had to be turned in under the threat of death. We had to wear a yellow star and therefore whenever I dared to go out on the street, I was often chased by gangs of boys who were pelting me with stones. I had to zigzag from building to building to try to avoid them. We were not allowed to attend a public school and so I just lost six years of formal schooling. We were not allowed to play in parks or attend concerts, movies, theater. We had to sit in the back of the streetcars. We were not allowed to travel outside of Prague. We were not allowed to associate with any non-Jewish friends. All our bank accounts were confiscated and our parents were not allowed to work. We were allowed to purchase only certain groceries and those were allowed to be bought only on certain days and on certain times of those days. 
I'm sure you will agree that this was a pretty dreadful and humiliating period in our lives. In addition, my father was arrested by the Gestapo, interrogated for helping his bosses transfer their wealth to England before the Nazis came, and shortly thereafter, he was murdered. A year later, my mother, my sister, and I were transported to Theresienstadt. Theresien is a Czech word, and Theresien, Theresienstadt is a German name for it, where we stayed for two and a half years until the war's end. The Theresienstadt camp in which we were held as prisoners was just that. It was portrayed to the world as a model camp to offset the nasty rumors that the Germans were killing off all the European Jews. In truth, Theresienstadt was a transition camp, not an extermination camp, as were many of the concentration camps, mostly in Poland. The Germans were even brought in uh, in a Red Cross, as a Red Cross representative from Switzerland, who was fooled completely as to the true conditions in Theresienstadt. The town was beautified before his arrival. Children were seen playing outdoors. People were sitting in a makeup cafeteria, concerts and musicals were performed. At one point, the commandant, SS Head Ram, was handing out cans of sardines to a bunch of boys, including me. We had been rehearsed before to say, Sean Vida Sardine and Uncle Ram. Sardines again, Uncle Ram. Of course, as soon as the Red Cross entourage left, we had to return the unopened cans and never saw them again, just like before. So now let me set the stage for the drama that unfolded for our family. In the fall of 1944, the Germans were beginning to realize that they were going to lose the war. In fact, the Germans capitulated just nine months later. So there was no need for any pretense anymore. But there was still one mission they had to perform for the Führer. They had to kill all the European Jews. In a span of a month's time, in September and October of 1944, they sent off to the east, and that's what they called it, 11 trains with about 1,500 human beings on each train. A couple of the trains carried 2,500 people. Nobody in the camp knew what the East meant, but nobody had ever returned from there. And it was a rare, a rare exception that some of us received a letter or a card from any of those who had departed. Now we know that all these trains were going to Auschwitz, where most of these inmates died in the gas chambers shortly upon their arrival. The departure of these 18,000 people meant that close to two thirds of all the people in, uh, living in Theresia at that time were being deported. My mother and her sister-in-law had an agreement that if one of them were deported and had an opportunity to write a card or a letter to the other one, they would write something that would please the census. And if it was good where they arrived, the handwriting would be up. If it was worse than in Theresia Stadt, the handwriting would be down. It turns out that my aunt was able to send a card and it said she was already working as a seamstress. Of course, she had never worked as a seamstress before. And the handwriting was down. That was a signal to my mother that she had to do everything possible to keep us in Theresienstadt. Needless to say, the minute after my aunt wrote that card, she was sent to the gas chambers. My mother, my sister, and I had been summoned to the assembly area to be sent on one of these trains a couple of times earlier in the year. But my mother was able to pull us out by reminding those who were making up the lists of all the good things my father had done for the Jewish community in Prague and elsewhere in Czechoslovakia before the war. But this time, when we again received the summons, there was no one for my mother to plead her case to because those people who had prepared the previous list had themselves been deported. We thus had no choice but to report to the assembly area the next day. The only good thing was that our number was over 1350 or close to the end of the line of the people called up to board the train. So that gave my mother one last opportunity to pull a rabbit out of her hat she suddenly disappeared from where we had sat down and ran to her place of work, the art department, 
she managed to find her boss, Joe Speer, the famous Dutch artist who headed the arts department, and told him that if we had received if we, if we had received a summons for the transport and that he should alert the assessment in charge of the arts department that the order he gave them to make teddy bears for his children and children of his friends for the upcoming Christmas would thus not get filled if she wasn't there to work on it. Fortunately, Mr. Spear immediately found the assessment and told him what my mother said. The assessment thought about it for a while and told Mr. Spear, all right, take her out. And then Mr. Spear said, but she has two children. And if they go, she will go with them. So the assessment said sternly, all right, pull them out as well, but no one else. So he scribbled the order on a small piece of paper, which Mr. Spielen gave to my mother. And she rushed with it back to the assembly area where we had been anxiously waiting for her. She ordered us to come with her and the three of us approached the registration desk and handed in the slip of paper from the assessment. Can we leave now, she asked. No, you can't leave yet. You have to go to the second floor of the assembly area and wait there in one of the rooms until the train departs. So we picked up our luggage and we started to walk up the stairway leading to the second floor. We entered the hallway and opened the door to the first room. The room was packed with people and there was no place for us to sit down. There must have been about 30, 35 people, people there. We continued to walk along the hallway and open the door to the second room. The same story. Still no space for us to sit down. We then walked to the third and last room, the one furthest away from the stairway. That room was only about half full and we were thus able to enter it and sit down. You could hear voices from below as people were still boarding the cattle cars on the train. And when the boarding was completed, there was silence. We thought the next thing we would hear was the departure of the train. Instead, suddenly there was this tremendous commotion we could hear the soldiers with their large dogs barking fiercely, running up the stairs, yelling 50 more, 50 more. Their big black boots clicking loudly and they opened the door to the first room next to the stairway and pulled everyone out. You can imagine this horrific scene. People who thought they were safe were fighting fiercely, but they were being pulled out of that room against their pleading, crying, screaming and yelling. They were forced to go downstairs and board the train. And then the soldiers entered the second room and pulled out half of the people from that room as well. The horrific scene was again being repeated. And in the meantime, we in the third room were holding our breath. You could hear a pin drop. There was a little boy there whose mother put her hand over his mouth so he wouldn't make a sound and bring us to the attention of the soldiers. And after a while, we could hear the soldiers' footsteps again. But instead of approaching our room, they were moving away. Then finally, the commotion ended. It was eerily quiet. And finally, we began to hear the squealing sounds of steel on steel. The train was finally beginning to pull away. As you can imagine, there was total jubilation in our room. Everyone was hugging everyone else. We had survived another day. There were four more transports after this one, but we were not on any of the lists. In the spring of 1945, the Germans started to construct gas chambers in Theresienstadt because by then Auschwitz was already liberated, but fortunately they ran out of time. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, I am able to be here today to tell you the story. In spite of my mother's amazing perseverance, we still needed also a stroke of luck to end up with a high number and to find refuge in the room that was the furthest away from the stairway in the assembly area. So that is the reason why I'm here to tell you this pretty incredible story. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your part of your story. 
And I'm just going to ask you a few questions um, uh, to expand a little bit. So um, how did you arrive at the title of your book? I have a picture of it here. Um, Somewhere There Is Still a Sun. And also, if you could tell us why it took 70 years until you were 85 before you decided to write such a book. All right. So uh, <clears throat> just a couple of days after we were liberated, my mother wrote a letter to her friends abroad. And the letter is copied in the introduction to my book. But I'll read to you the last paragraph uh, that reads as follows. We do not know yet how the future will shape up for us. None of our old friends are alive anymore. We do not know where we are going to live. Nothing. But somewhere in the world, there's still a sun. Mountains, the ocean, books, small clean apartments, and perhaps again the rebuilding of a new life. The, the title came from this last sentence, and it was a staff member at Simon & Schuster that came up with that title. So I just want to continue a little bit here. Little did we all know that just eight years later, after a two years stay in Cuba, where I had to learn very quickly the Spanish and English languages, I would be standing on the steps of MIT in Massachusetts with my cap and gown next to my beaming mother, having just graduated from this prestigious institution. It's quite amazing after only eight years that happened. Remarkable. Yeah. So your question uh, about, about your decision to write this book. Okay, well, my mother, right after we were liberated, she, she had collected all kinds of uh, um, documents and pictures and uh, everything, letters and things like that. And she organized them well and put them in an album. And uh, she had that album. And once in a while, she showed it to people that were in Terezin. Uh, then uh, when she passed away in 1974, I inherited that album. And when I became 80, I started to think about what I could do with this album. And uh, I was thinking about the uh, a uh, museum in Terezin or uh, the uh, Czech, uh, you know, the Jewish Museum in Prague or uh, Beit Terezin Stadt in Israel. And I finally decided I would give it to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. So I called the curator and uh, she came by my house and looked at it and she couldn't believe her eyes because these days, they get only one letter or they get one document, but here was a whole compilation of things from Terezin, very well organized and presented. So she took it back to Washington and, and presented it to the uh, entire board of the museum and they couldn't believe it. So I got sort of caught in the excitement and I decided to write a book, a children's book telling the story, or having the, the bear narrate the story. And I send that story around. And after two and a half years, I suddenly get a phone call from uh, the editor of Aladdin Books, in, which is a subsidiary of uh, Simon and & Schuster. And they said, we think there's something to it. We, as a matter of fact, we think there's much more to it than what you wrote. And we would like to send a professional uh, writer to uh, Boston and interview you and then uh, write it. And that's what they did. They hired, uh, it took a while, but they finally hired somebody in uh, uh, Evanston, Illinois. And uh, he came here, interviewed me for a couple of days. Then he even went to Prague and Terezin to just find out what it's all about. And uh, then he started writing and we were corresponding every hour on the hour. Uh, he sent me what he wrote and, and it sort of jarred my memory about other things and when, he, when he started writing these things. So uh, uh, that's what happened. That's uh, how we got to, I really lucked out because uh, the fellow that wrote it uh, with me is, uh, did a fantastic job, I thought. He, he's sort of used to writing for uh, young adults and uh, it came out very well. 
It, it certainly did. I have to say that um, when you read the book, you feel like you're in your body as a teenager and you, you see the world from the perspective of a 13 year old. Right. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, uh, the other question I wanted to ask you re relating to your book, um, in it you describe actually some fun times that you had in the camp. Uh, you played soccer a lot. Um, you, you lived with other boys. You, we had pillow, fly, pillow fights. There was a lot of camaraderie among your bunk mates. Um, and uh, you, you, you fellows seem to in some way ignore the crowded conditions and uh, people dying nearby. Um, and it seemed, um, and it seemed that the one thing that uh, the only thing that you really were worried about was the transport to the east. So the question we have is, were you aware of all these other dangers um, in those years where you were with your bunkmates? Well, I thought about that question and I thought maybe the best way is to um, tell you about our Madrid, Madrid. Uh, our your teacher. counselor, your counselor, right, yes. Right. So his name was Francis Meyer and we called him Franta. Uh, he was only 20 years old, but he was put into a job with enormous responsibilities. His qualifications for the job were that he had worked as an, in an orphanage before coming to Terezin, and that's mm -hmm. where he gained his experience. He was big and strong, and he ruled with fear. He was in charge of 40 rambunctious boys and had to make sure they didn't fight among themselves. And of course, the number kept changing as some boys were sent away in a transport and new ones came in. He became our father and mother, and he therefore didn't allow any interference from the actual parents. They became one of his biggest problems. He insisted on cleanliness and hygiene because he wanted to make sure we didn't get sick. But on the other hand, he arranged for us to get surreptitious lessons from various teachers who also were in Terezin and they were teaching history, geography, math, physics, language. At night, he read us from an adventure book, The Northwest Passage. He taught us how to sing a canon, and in general, he introduced us to music and literature. He organized us into a soccer team, and we competed against teams from other rooms. He was our coach and cheerleader. He himself was a fabulous and fearless goalie playing for the teacher's team against the teams from cooks and electricians and so on. All the young girls flocked to him in admiration and we too were of course very proud of him. So on one hand, we were scared of him. And on the other hand, we admired him and appreciated what he was doing for us. Basically, and this is really the answer to your question, Basically, he tried to make us forget what miserable conditions we were living under. And he tried to teach us that to survive, we had to work together as a team, not just to look out for ourselves. But one evening, I saw the strong guy sitting in the corner crying. He had survived another day and wondered what the next day would bring. So he was human after all. He too, like many of the boys, was sent to Auschwitz, where he survived the selection and several other camps and a death march. And after liberation, he emigrated to New York and eventually started a very successful paper factory in California. Thank you. Um, yes, see, when you read the book, you, um, you really get a wonderful sense for what incredible leadership he had and how carefully he took care of all of you. Um, so our last question, because uh, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, is um, if you could share with us the lessons that, that you've learned um, from your experience. Well, I, uh, I have really two items that I can talk about. The first item is uh, don't be married to your possessions. Uh, a lot of people lost their lives because they couldn't uh, leave uh, their farm or their, uh, you know, their factory or, or their practice, and they stayed there, and unfortunately, they lost their life because of that. I remember very clearly that when we left Prague, uh, April 11th, 1948, uh, we took a train to Paris, and when we got to the border, 
by the way, we left legitimately. We had a passport and all that because the communists didn't take over until a couple of weeks later. Uh, when we got to the border, there was a guy that boarded the train. All he had is a backpack. And he stood there and the train started leaving and he looked at his watch. He said, well, it's nine o'clock. All my employees are beginning to come to work. He was the owner of a factory and he just left everything behind him just to escape and uh, have freedom. So that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Don't uh, get married to your uh, possessions because they can always be uh, replaced. Uh, we lost our possessions on four different occasions, all of them, and uh, managed to replace them. So it's not a big problem. And the other advice I have is, and I learned that from my mother, don't take a no for an answer. Hmm. Uh, you may have to go to 10 people and they all will say no, but maybe the 11th one will say yes. As you just have to be, uh, you know, persuasive and uh, just never give up. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, there's so much more that we could talk about and um, we'll do so on another occasion. And I hope that after COVID, more people will get to meet you in person. Um, so I, I, again, I wanted to thank you and um, I want to thank all of you, um, all the participants in tonight's program and everyone who was able to tune in. I want to say a special thank you to my colleagues, uh, Pierre Weitzman from the um, Israeli House, um, who was so instrumental in making tonight's program happen, and also to my consulate colleague, Hannah Sinrich. It's so important that we continue um, uh, while we can to still hear these personal accounts of survivors as, as we did tonight. Sadly, the need to share these stories is not just of historical interest, it's immediate. Our community is still reeling in, here in the Boston area from the abhorrent recent incident at Duxbury High School where high school football players unbelievably use terms such as Auschwitz, gas chambers, Hitler as play calls in a football game. We must redouble our efforts, not just to condemn these hateful acts, but to educate and speak out loud and clear so that this virulent, virulent and hurtful anti-Semitism will not be tolerated. I wish to conclude our program tonight with a very powerful quote from the German theologian Martin Niemöller, who was a Lutheran pastor best known for his opposition to the Nazi regime. First, they came for the communists. And I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then, they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. We must always remember, we must never forget, and we must always speak out. Good night, shalom to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.